the family of the future, its continuity, that finely woven thread that keeps the family pattern much the same, and its change, where the warp and the woof of life is combined, but in a different way. However, looking at today's family, by far the majority of them are in the traditional pattern, the husband and wife blend. A little more than half of those couples have children in the home, and about half have no children. For some, that's a choice, and for others, it reflects that the kids have grown and gone. We have more people living alone today, some widowed, of course, but more young people choosing their own way of living as they settle in the job market away from home. And we do have more single parent families than before, reflecting primarily a higher divorce rate. But this is still a small percentage of our total family units. And then there's that category called other. Again, a small percentage. But here's where the unmarried couples, the communes, the convenience type living arrangements fit in. All family patterns are much the same in one sense or another. And no matter what our family makeup is, we all have about the same pathway toward growth. It's a double track path, if you will, and we need both of them for balance as we go. One is for our own individual growth, our identity or self-concept, well-trodden throughout life as we learn, seek, want, change. The other is for our family growth, giving stability and balance to our stride down life's path. It dips in and out of the dependency we all have for each other. That interdependency woven with adapting, caring, growing, changing. How does a family weave these threads of interdependency throughout their circle of life? We asked them, and willing to share some of their concerns with you are the Mollendorfs, a reconstituted family, his, hers, and theirs, with both parents employed. The Smiths, also a second marriage family, and both working outside the home. The Watermans, a traditional family makeup. He teaches, and she used to, but is a full-time homemaker now. The Robinsons, he just finished some schooling and she's a daycare provider at home. The O'Briens, her husband was at work the day we were there. The Waldschmitz, her husband too was at work. And two single parent families, Suzanne Boyd and her son Bill, and Jeff Brightman and his son Scott. These are the families that will help us take a look at ourselves and some of our concerns as families. And are we the adapting, caring, growing, changing family of today? The adapting family can plan ahead and still has what it takes to work at those differences that might loom up. We, we usually talk things over. You know, when something will come up, we'll talk about what we think and, and what kind of what kind of behavior we want, you know. The kids know that, that in the morning when they get up, they go to the babysitter and one of us will pick them up whenever we're done. You know, whoever is done first picks up the kids. We don't think of it as, as a real hassle no. problem, it's just something we live with. And just the way we do, we do And we both worked since we've had children that uh, that's the only way I, I really know how to adjust. Yep. Brian takes Emily to the sitter, which is only a block and a half away from us. And uh, here, then he walks to school from there. Sometimes? Sometimes, yes. But uh, if he's not taking her, then we'll walk her up or ride her bikes there. We visit with our friends about raising kids, but you know, a lot of them have kids the same age, and we don't know if they're doing the right thing either until it's too late. And, and then we see friends of ours who have, who have their kids raised, and we don't, and they, we ask them, and they will, they're not sure what they did. They're, they're glad they did the right thing, you know. As far as, as going to somebody for advice, I don't, 
I think the only thing you can do is just give it your best shot and do what you think is right. You know, I hope it works out. I agree with Mike very much on it that um, you, know, you can only go so much with what your friends have done. You know, whether you believe it's right or wrong, uh, you've got to decide for yourself if this is the right thing to do with your children. <laughs> I don't see any reason a father can't love his child the same as a mother. I also don't see any reason that a father can't do the same things for a child that a mother does. And I'll grant you, I come home and I cook and I clean and do all the things that a mother would have to do and, you know, and tend to his needs. But, you know, it can be coped with, with a father, I think, just as easily as with a mother. Now, the thing is the effect that it has on the man's career. I haven't really been passed over for anything because of my problems in taking care of him, but you are limited. So, you know, certainly it was not easy for me to travel in any context. He was very young, and uh, things are much different now because he's much more independent than he was. And with the freedom that I've given him, uh, you know, maybe there's too much there. I, I don't have a good feel for that yet. I'm not uncomfortable with the situation yet. I've very rarely had an instance where I absolutely couldn't find out where he was. Adaptability differs from one family to another, partly because of family heritage, partly because of past experiences of family members, and partly due to the changes that family members are going through. All of my sisters and I were broke up when we were small children, and we went with different relatives. And it's important that you learn to communicate and learn to get along. Sometimes it's difficult. Everybody has their fights. I have learned that if there is something wrong, that you, you work it out. You, know? you don't give up, because it's so easy to give up. And it seems so simple, and it seems that, oh, all the problems will be settled if you just split up. But that's not the way it works. I feel, I personally feel that problems just start when you split up. You know, when, if a family breaks up, then your problems really just start then. They don't end there. When I was brought up, they didn't have no inside toilets. Whether well, everyone else had them, but we didn't. <laughs> we didn't have no electric, no gas, no. One thing we had in our house was cold water. And it's, uh, you know, you, 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 you got to learn how to do something, to be somebody, you know. You can't, you, you just can't sit around waiting for somebody to give it to you because nobody's going to give you nothing. Nothing's like you read about in the storybooks. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, and it's kind of a letdown because life isn't storybook style. You don't grow up and marry a doctor or a lawyer and you sit and everything is one big happy family. Yeah, no, it's not like that. And I think that the main thing I try to push on to my children is to, uh, for them to realize that it's not like you read about in storybooks. You don't always come out on top. You have to work for what you get and that it's, it's just not like the little fairy tales, live happily ever after. If you do, you make it that way. But a family rule is if you, you need to do good in school and you need to keep yourself up. Like my mom, she, she you know, she's all me and my brother all the time because she knows that she, did, she wants us to have the things that she didn't have in life. And that's the way my dad is, too. We try to make the decisions together. I mean, I won't make a decision without talking to him with Dee first. But I will. There's a lot of things that he wants to talk out with me, and I just don't want to hear it. And I'll tune him out, most definitely. He can just talk and talk and talk, and I can look him dead in the face and not hear one word he says. I learned that from my mother. <laughs> So how's it resolved, Del? What is, uh, if she's not moving, well, that means you after it goes on long enough, she gets upset. She says it doesn't bother her, but after I fuss at her long enough, she usually comes to the surface and we can get it talked out. And she still won't budge on it, but we usually compromise somewhere down the line, and we just let it go at that. You know, that's all you can do. It's either that or, you know, pack your clothes and give up. And that's something I don't intend to do. <laughs> Uh, this is my family. You know, I mean, I have tipped my clothes and said, hey, I'm leaving. I can't handle this no more, but I've only gone around the corner. <laughs> so that's as far as I go. I mean, this is my family. And no matter how mad we get, we may act like we're breaking up, but we ain't going nowhere. I'm usually the one to go storming out. You know, I fooled her one time. I said, you, you got to go. This is my house, too, you know. So 
didn't work out very well. She only stood outside the door until I let her back in. But. <laughs> you didn't have the keys with you. <laughs> when children are small, the adaptability pattern for many families is pretty tight. In other words, the family environment is fairly well structured then. But as the family members grow, parents start giving their children more responsibility. That makes the environment more flexible. We'd have them come home first thing, do their homework, get it out of the way, then do their chores, and they're free the rest of the evening. They've got all the necessities finished. Didn't always work out that way, so I just made up, because they'd always say, I forgot, I forgot. So finally I said, this is a good way not to forget. I'll write them down. You guys will know they're there to look at. I, I'm trying to teach them responsibility because someday they will be on their own and they're, they're going to need to help take care of themselves. And it does get to be quite a chore. Well, anyway, they just seem to always forget. And I figured this would be a way so they don't forget. And there's no excuse for forgetting. It's written right up on the wall. And if they forget, then we go from there. But I feel good once I've got my duties done, then I know that I can play out and not get in trouble. I just want them to learn responsibility and be able to be organized because they are going to be on their own someday. Well, I don't know. When you have five children in your home and you have them involved in music activities, in sports activities, uh, just keeping the laundry up and a little bit of dirt out of the corners and enough food on the table. I, we, we garden and I do a lot of canning and freezing and uh, I, never, I, I don't really even notice there's too much leisure time if you want to really want the truth. <laughs> uh, Linda has a part-time job at the rest home and with the boys being in athletics and, and in band. Uh, tonight they have a rehearsal after supper and with Cecil's uh, school activities plus a couple of other boards that he serves on and, and uh, work that we do for our church, we're really kind of going in lots of different directions. So, uh. My problem is really trying to keep them organized, keep their uh, equipment working and keep everything rolling. I guess that's about, uh, but it's, it's a wonderful challenge. Uh, I think we, I'm really happy that our children cooperate in many of the ventures that they do. It's, a, it's, a, it's the only way it can succeed, I guess. If they fight us all the way, it's a real problem. Whenever I have a problem or something that needs to be worked out, I find it, it's very easy to go to both of my parents and just sit down and try to work out the way, you know, when I, like when I need the car, or maybe when they need it, and then try to get things scheduled around so it satisfies both of us. Basic to family adaptability is family leadership, which can range all the way from strict authoritarian to a more democratic way where all members have input, or discipline, again, ranging from strict to a more permissive atmosphere, or negotiation, which may be very limited to where there's almost no end to the options open, or organization. With a greater degree of organization, there's less slippage for family problems to arise, and also values, and that core of family values usually is learned by one generation from another. The one thing we want is total honesty, you know, if, even if it's a stupid little thing like, did you take a bite out of that apple, you know, I expect the truth. Or if if uh, somebody pulled all the onions up in our garden, well, he knows he's going to be in trouble, but we want the truth. And, and uh, I guess we spend more time stressing that. You know, that's something we've really talked about and we feel really strong about. You know, someday he's going to maybe get in trouble and, and something happened. We've got to know what's wrong. And, and I guess that's when we'll find out if we did a good job teaching him to be honest. You know. Politeness. Uh, this is becoming a rule. You know, it's, it's kind of put in practice, but it's becoming a rule around here that you don't automatically demand that you be polite and ask, because that's really the only way you're really going to get anything. If you can demand, you might get it, but you're not going to get a smile out of it. Be what you can be, not what someone wants you to be, or, 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 or don't try to go higher than you are. You know, be what you, you know, be what you are, be what you can be. If you're black, be black. If you're white, be white, you know, but, but accept everyone as a human being and damn all the rest of it, you know. Don't, don't, don't let uh, education or, or anything get in your way, you know. You, you got to accept everyone. I don't care how low they are and I don't care how high they are. You got to accept everyone as they are. You know, look at a person for being that person, you know, like, uh, like you're a lady. Look at, look at you for being a lady. Look at you for being a gentleman. Not, not, not what color he is, not, not nationality. 
not not nothing like that. You know, you you, you got to you, you got to feel from the inside, and don't always try to downgrade somebody. You know, try to build somebody up so that maybe maybe I'm not saying they will. Maybe they maybe they never will. But 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 you know, maybe they'll be somebody someday. You know, I always think of the point. You know, life's not promised to anybody. You know, I may not be here tomorrow. So the main thing that I try to pass on to my kids, and I drive it into them almost every day of their lives, is to get their education. I'm always worried about emergencies. If I should become ill, if Bill should become ill, it would have a devastating effect on our family. Um, I've got to think about saving for his education later on. I've been doing that recently, wondering, you know, where am I going <laughs> to squeeze a penny here to start a fund for that? Uh, financial problems I worry about. Well, I think that's a real problem today that with young families is becoming dependent on the two salaries. If something should ever happen to one of them, they're just out of luck. There's no way they can survive a one salary. It's, it's very, very hard for us to live on just my salary, uh, and I don't, I don't pretend that we do it, but we use a lot of Donna's salary too. But like we planted a garden, and I have been canning and freezing things. Uh, you know, that way I think it saves a, a tremendous amount on our food bill. We've got absolutely nothing saved for the kids' education right now. There are a lot, a lot of other things we need to save money for right now. Uh, as far as kids' education, I, that's the thing that bothers me. I don't know what we'll do when that time comes. Adapting, caring, growing, changing. All a part of a family's day or a family's lifetime. What is that cohesive bond that holds a family together? Well, we've never called them a council meeting, but I, I guess we do try to, at least once a day, have our family together around the table sometime or another, and, and I like to hear their problems, their challenges, and of course I like to uh, feel that we at that time can give them a little advice and hope that uh, they can choose to follow it if, if that advice seems uh, s suitable to their situation, but I'm sure we don't do enough of it, but uh, we'll keep trying. I think one of the ways that we sort of have a cohesive fe feeling in our family is that everybody works together at our home. I mean, my boys uh, do laundry and they do dishes and sweep floors and vacuum and as well as the girls and the girls help on the garden and they do some of the lawn mowing and... Uh, well, you even had them involved in... Uh uh, canning, canning yes. Summer, no, I have a lot of family support. The kids help me wash clothes and fold them, and they carry them upstairs and put them away. Um, Mike does a lot of help with housework for me. Uh, you know, if there's something that needs to be done and I'm not here, I can depend on them to help me in that respect. But uh, usually we. We work together in getting things done. Uh, meals are, are usually very simple. Uh, Mostly peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> we have a lot of peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> With small children in the family, the level of family caring is more closely knit. As the children grow, their peers and others may become increasingly more influential. Then family unity tends to become more separated. There's a mutual bond there that I, you know, I, I just, I know I can trust him. It's even like him being here alone. You know, he could bring kids in here and they could literally tear the house apart. But he won't do that. He'll have his friends in sometime, but they'll sit here and play the electronic games on the TV or play the piano or just talk or listen to tapes. And I come home and things are, are in good order. And, you know, I can trust him to do those things. Well, I can play with my friends most of the time, and I go to ball games, and I play football. If I'm always at his games. I go to every football game. I went to all these Little League games, and I enjoy those things, and I want to be there. But as far as the actual doing together, you know, we probably don't do that much. 
the junior high or the middle school age as it's referred today, I think is a very critical age, very critical. These youngsters again are uh, opening the door to new walks of life and uh, they have a hard time always, always keeping them ha their hands on who am I, what am I doing and where am I going. I don't think we ever try to hide uh, uh, our feelings about uh, well, family problems, maybe financial situation at a given time. Uh, uh, we try to, you know, that isn't something that's, that's between just Cecil and myself. I mean, we share it with them too. Um, I think one thing that hopefully will help uh, them as they face situations in their growing up p times is, uh, oh, if a situation has occurred in our family. What do we sometimes tell you about, like Linda, for instance, if she's getting to do something that you can't do? And you say it isn't fair. And what do we tell you? What do you have to do? Yes. It's the closeness, the common ground, the support from each other, the decision making, the unity. These are the kinds of ties that bind a family together. You know, I think that period of time when they come home from school is, it's just, that essentially is uh, the time you need to be home. And not just when they're young, like Janelle is, but when they're teenagers too, because if they've got something bothering them, you can sense that when they come in the door. Uh, our children referred to this that as often as possible, and uh, that if they can come to an adult and feel comfortable in discussing their problem, many of their problems seem like mountains, and some of them are mountains to them. But so if they have a chance just to sound it out and somebody to respond, and either clarify where their standing is on that, whether we're right or wrong, at least they can gain another perspective. And this many times, I think, helps them to uh, uh, take a better look at the challenge that they met that day. Mm. Gray Jay. I call him Gray Jay because he's gray. And the cat jumps on me in bed and licks my hair, falls asleep with me, all, all snuggled up. I think that single parent families find they are more isolated than the two parent families with children. I think mothers especially because they're 24 hours in charge of a child so that eliminates the uh, spontaneity of just jumping in the car and going to visit a friend or saying to your spouse uh, watch the kid for a couple of minutes I'm going to go get a quart of milk. It takes a lot of planning to, um, to do the smallest little thing. I think a lot of single parents find that as a surprise. Grace, no. But as far as um, socializing, because it's such a problem to plan to go someplace, we usually go together. We read. We spend a lot of time at the house and um, visiting with a few of our friends. My sister and I took our two kids two years ago in my Volkswagen on a 4,000 mile trip and slept in a pup tent. That's the uh, sophisticated vacations that we take. But, you know, when I was a child, we went all the time, all over the United States. Your and, family? Oh, yeah. That, everything that I, each time I think about camping, I come up with something new to tell them, and they really enjoy it. And we sit and talk about our adventures of camping and vacationing, and now they're seeing it and enjoying it. My husband and Lance were up at 4 o'clock this morning. They set the alarm, got up hunting night crawlers. Oh, like the camping. Everybody works together to load the car and unload the car and set up the tent. And get the, the kids will go get water and firewood and get water. Uh, beds made. We play cards together, dice. Games, any games, we'll sit at the table or even out camping, we'll sit and play cards and dice. And, and sometimes we put models together. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so That's important to me. I know dice. the days are kind of busy. My husband some days has real busy hours. It's not always easy, but boy, every chance there is, we take advantage of sitting down and playing cards or some sort of game or working together on something. There's even times my husband and my kids will stand and do dishes just 
to help me. Sometimes we just do something out of ordinary and we feel like celebrating and we celebrate, that's it. So, something also that, that we like to do, uh, we like to do things together, all of us. He takes us fishing. Lots of times we don't want to go because he goes too early in the morning. <laughs> he wants you up at 6 o'clock to be out on the fish bank. But uh, we like to go fishing together, and uh, we, we drive out, you know, to Sailorville, and we like to look around. Stuff, you know, you can do together. Every day during the year, we have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get ready for work because we both drive school buses. Okay, this kind of cheats the kids. We don't have a lot of time to spend with them. We're back during the day, back in, you know, to work in the evening, and it really slows us down uh, as far as spending time with the kids. So since we're off for a few weeks, I keep uh, cooler loaded at all times and ready to go and we just get up in the morning and if we feel like going to a park or over to their grandparents' house or whatever, it's ready, it's there. If your family has all these things, then you do have a true family indeed. And true too is that the picture taken today of your family will never be the same as the picture taken tomorrow. The family is never static. It's forever changing. Its members grow in many ways, like it or not. Then my children stay children. <laughs> I don't want them, you know, that's, I guess that's everybody's, they think, well, I can hardly wait till they grow up, but I've pictured it in my mind and I, I really want to keep my children little as long as I can. I guess my life, everybody's told me, surrounds around them. You know, in a few years, we haven't got that many left. You know, he's in sixth grade, he's got two years of junior high and four years of high school, and then he's on his own. And then I will come home to that empty house. And I've got to start look forward to the day that I don't come home to that empty house. So I was very content to just be raising him between the ages of four and 10 or 11 or so forth. But now that he's old enough to look after himself somewhat, I've got to start to look after myself somewhat. Me. Hello. I think me. I don't ever want to change. I'm a kid at heart. I want to stay that way. Because I like fooling around, messing around. And my boys, I don't, I don't ever want them to change, but I know they will. They'll grow up and they'll change. But I, I like the free spirit of a child, you know. I guess that's what it is. I don't want the free spirit to ever change. <laughs> Does that sound weird? I think everything will stay the same. I don't think I need a one or, you know, anything. Uh, I just hope that we're still loving each other and still married until I die. You know? Scott would like, I think, for us to have a family. It's not that he minds living with me. He'd just rather that we were a little bigger group, I think, and that there was a mother in the home. And it would be better. As, uh, as our family grows, I believe we will go, grow stronger together, stronger knit in bonds of love, and I feel that it's a whole growth process, and I don't think you can stay the same. I don't think anything can. You know, I think all of it is an eventual growth process, and I really don't think anything can stay the same. And I'm not so sure, well, I don't know whether I'd really want it to or not. I'm thinking. We're a much more easygoing family. Now, four years ago, the only child was Amy. She would have been two at the time. And uh, we, uh, we just have learned to communicate better, my husband and I have. And with, with Mary and with Lori coming into our family, we've learned just to take things uh, one day at a time, you know, and not get upset about little things if something gets spilled or thrown, or because it's bound to happen, you know. and. Um, as a whole, the children play really well together, and they're starting to play with the baby now, you know, where she's not just a baby that lays around and cries. They're starting to involve her in her, her activity, you know, in their activities, and they've started to, um, as a family, where uh, the children are getting to the age now where we can really talk to them, and we sit down and talk a lot. We sit down and read a lot. But four years from now, I would say, I'm not really certain if we'll be financially any better off. If we are, that's fine. 
If we're not, that's okay too. <laughs> Either way, it'll be all right. Uh, I feel four years down the road, we will be, I hope an even closer family where we, as the children start to age a little bit, we start getting into physical as well as um, communication activities with them. And um, because Lori will be at that age where we can all go swimming together or we can all go bicycle riding or something together. You know, four years from now, there are a lot, of more, a lot more things that we can all do together than we can right now. I just, I just feel personally that four years from now, we will be even happier than we are now. Adapting, caring, growing, and changing. An ongoing process in every healthy family. And the strength of that family depends a great deal upon how skillfully they weather those changes. Changes that are actually a necessary part of their growth together. He's been with the babysitter since he was three months old. Well, I've had a babysitter that came to the home. I've had a daycare center. I've had situations where I took him to the to the daycare provider. Uh, he went to a day camp with the YWCA this summer. Um, he's experienced a lot of social situations. Just helped him to be him. It's helped him to face who he is and to test himself. Um, he can't, he can't be any other way. He's just the way he is. So I don't think it's harmed him. He's been in safe environments, and that's the most important. What are our responsibilities as a family? Yeah. Well, the obvious one is to provide a good home, you know, a stable home where, where a kid can, can grow up knowing that, you know, it's always going to be there, and, it's, and his parents are always going to act reasonably responsible. <laughs> A place where a child can come back to for support, uh, help if needed. I remember how m what my parents did, and I guess I didn't turn out so bad, so I kind of used them as my guide. Uh, that's, I, I think everybody does that. You know, you remember what you did as a child and how you felt, and you react to some of the things that your children do as to well, my folks did this to me when I was young. Uh, you know, this just isn't acceptable type thing, behavior. So uh, I guess you relate to how you were raised very much. We were both raised on farms. So it's, you know, it's a lot different. It's, yeah. Yeah. You know, because they have their, their friends right here. You know, it, for, in our lives, it was a big day when we got to go to town and play with our friends. And if we got to take our bicycle in and ride around town with them, that was unbelievable. You know, where, where do they live with that every day? We didn't have the peer group pressures and problems that, that I think Brian and Emily and Jenny are going to have, just because they're exposed to them so much more. I know Brian probably thinks we're horrible sometimes when we tell him he can't go across the street and play with the other kids. but. Sometimes there's a point where I think a child should stay home and play with his own things. We have a lot of things to do in our yard. Yeah, we have a lot of things for kids to do outside. Uh, and like that, I don't think it hurts him to work once in a while. He has jobs to do, and when I'm out working in the yard, he very often comes out and helps me. Sometimes not always voluntarily, but you know, nonetheless, I don't. <laughs> I don't think it hurts. It hurts a kid to know how to work either. When I come home and find the bed unmade, I should go out and get him and make him come in and make the bed. But it's so much easier to just go up there and make it myself and not worry about it. And, you know, his, when he grows up and gets married, his wife is going to hate me. <laughs> he drops his clothes on the floor, he leaves his bed undone, the towels are on the floor in the bathroom, the drawers are open, and, uh, that sort of thing. So I know I'm not raising a, a model husband for someone by any means, but uh, they're going to have to live with it or he's going to have to change one or the other. To tell you the truth, I think it's typical 12-year-old boy, and that's why I'm not so concerned with it yet. I, I'm too old to remember how I was <laughs> at 12, but I, I learned how to do the things I do partly, and this is part of the reason, I guess, that I've been able to care for him maybe a little better than some other fathers is because since I was in my early teens, I've been doing all these things for myself. For some period during my teenage years, I lived with my grandparents, 
And the only way that worked was that I had, if I wanted clean clothes, I had to wash. And my brother and I both lived with my grandparents for a while, it was because of a family situation. And, you know, we helped in the kitchen. He cooked, I washed dishes. And I learned those things from an early age. Now, he liked to get involved in these things to some extent. When I'm in the kitchen sometimes, he'll want to help. More so in the winter than in the summer, because in the summer it's eat and run. Uh, but in the winter, he'll help out in the kitchen, and he's interested because he sees me doing these things, he wants to do them. They have certain things that they're supposed to do. Of course, they're like any other kids, if you're not on their backs constantly, somehow they don't get done. But as far as on an adult situation, we split things pretty much down the middle. As a matter of fact, while I was, I worked all the time I was carrying the baby, and um, drove a school bus until about three weeks before I had her. And um, he carried the ball. He cooked and cleaned, and so we, it's pretty much, and he still does, he does a lot. You like, you like those? <coughs> yeah, that's why I'm, uh, it's hard, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. You don't think so? Mm -mm. Uh, as a matter of fact, if, if I had my choice, I would just gonna stay home and take care of the house and the kids if I wasn't gonna work. Because I enjoy being with the kids, we enjoy each other, we get along just fine. And I like cooking, and I like washing, I don't mind washing dishes. It seems like when I'm doing them, everything's going smooth. When we do them together, they go fairly smooth. When she does them, everything's a shamble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my mom, she gets on us, but sometimes all of us, we might argue ourselves, but we still love each other and everything. I think when we have problems, it kind of brings us closer together. <laughs> We need each other more than ever at the time. Sometimes we'll just sit down and talk it out. Sometimes my husband and I do, because some of it doesn't really concern the children and nothing they can do about it. I like taking care of Doofus, and he's a pretty good dog. And when he runs off, I catch him. <coughs> I bring him home and put him on the chain. He'll stay on the chain for a little while and then we'll bring him in the house First and now we've got him trained so then he won't run off anymore we can just sometimes if he gets loose in the yard we'll let him go for a few minutes and then he'll come to the door and wait in the middle of the night once he came and then yeah, he was scratching at the door yeah and i had to get out of bed and get him my children will always be there even after they've grown. I hope they come back and remember who I am. <laughs> but I think my children are most important. I was out shopping one day with a girlfriend about four years ago, and we was looking at posters and this and that. And I, of all the posters I had seen, I spotted that one, and that is the way I've always felt. I've just never been able to put it into those words. Of anything in the world, all the money in the world, I, I want to be happy and have my love. That's all I've ever wished for. Sunday. It's hard to believe, after so noisy a Saturday night, that it can be so quiet now. There were so many words I wanted to use last night. Words like tomorrow, together, and love. If I say, I love you, I want it to mean more than I love peanut butter or James Bond movies. I want it to mean I'm letting go for always. I've been afraid before, but I won't turn back now. I've never used the word love before. Never. But let's not talk about love. Let's talk about dogs or summertime. We can read the funny papers out loud or go to the zoo or just stay here like we are. 
come out along the trees with me. You never knew my middle name. I never told you that. Do you know I can stand on my hands? Almost. There's probably a mole down your back that escaped my eyes in the darkness. We need to know it all, everything that brought us to each other's arms, and why. All those mysteries we've saved for no one, we can give to one another. Where did the night go? Already it's Sunday. I love you.